Next, I'm going to talk to you about octet rule violators. The first type of octet rule violator that we're going to look at is what we call atoms with open shells. In other words, the valence shell is not complete. We call these uh, open shells sometimes, we call them incomplete octets. It's kind of just indicating that we actually don't have an octet on that atom. Now I'm going to show this to you with an example. Um, I'm going to sort of skip through all the details here. You're going to have to kind of work it out for yourself. Here's the formula, BF3. So BF3 has 24 valence electrons. When we calculate 6n plus 2 for this, we get a number of 26. So that shows that we have a delta of 2. So in theory, we could say 1 multiple bond. So then we put boron, which is the less electronegative, in the center. We put the fluorines all around it. We draw in a multiple bond and we fill in remaining electrons. And we get a structure that looks like this. Uh, the boron is going to have to have a negative formal charge because it wants 3 and it currently owns 4. This fluorine is going to have to have a positive formal charge because it wants 7 and currently only owns 6. This might be our proposed structure. And we're going to see that this is actually, it's a valid resonance structure, but it's not really the best representation for a couple reasons. The first one is that if we look, fluorine is a very electronegative atom. So it doesn't make sense for fluorine to be giving an electron back to boron. Boron being an atom with a very low electronegativity it makes more sense for it to pull this pair of electrons, not share it, and leave boron empty. Later on, we're also going to talk about Lewis acids, and we're gonna see that BF3 is a classic Lewis acid, and in order to be a Lewis acid, you have to have an incomplete octet. So we generally believe this is the better representation right here. We leave boron with an incomplete octet, and when we calculate formal charges, none of these atoms have a formal charge. Now, um, there are some other justifications for this. For example, we've shown, it's been shown experimentally that the three boron to fluorine bonds are identical. They have the same length, they have the same strength. When we have a molecule with single bonds and double bonds between the same elements, the double bond bonds tend to be shorter and stronger so having three identical bonds is more consistent with this structure than that structure where we have two bonds and then one that's different. Okay, so that's an example of an atom, a Lewis structure where there's an atom with an incomplete octet, an open shell, but the structure is a reasonable structure. And in general, we see this kind of thing with boron atoms in our formula and aluminum. So what you could do as a just a rough rule to start with, if you are doing a Lewis structure with a boron or an aluminum and you calculate an unsaturation of delta two, leave an incomplete octet on the boron or the aluminum. Next we have atoms with expanded octets. Again, I'm gonna start by working out an example here to show you why this, why we might do this, how we could find this, etc. So what I want to do is I want to do the Lewis structure of this ion, SO4 2 minus. So SO4 2 minus has a total of 32 valence electrons. It turns out when we calculate 6n plus 2, we also get 32. So this says that we should be able to get a structure with no multiple bonds. So putting sulfur in the middle, oxygen all the way around it, filling in remaining electrons, so all the oxygens have complete octets, and then filling in formal charges, where each oxygen has a minus formal charge and the sulfur has a two plus or a plus two formal charge, we end up with this structure. That's a perfectly valid Lewis structure. Follows the octet rule. Yeah, we have formal charges, but that just indicates that the atoms have a different number of electrons in their vicinity than what they might immediately desire, okay? 
And in fact, actually one of the nice things about this structure is that all of the oxygen to sulfur bonds are identical. We know that SO4, all of the oxygen to sulfur bonds are identical. Um, so therefore, this is a totally reasonable structure. It turns out, however, that when this theory was being sort of built up, there were some people that felt uncomfortable with all of these formal charges. It's kind of a complicated looking structure. So what they said was this. If we look, we have a positively charged atom, a sulfur, directly adjacent to a negatively charged atom, an oxygen, and that atom has unshared electrons. So what that atom in theory could do is donate or move one of these pairs of electrons down to in between the sulfur and the oxygen, in between the positive and negative atom. That would create a multiple bond. But what it would also do is it would cause the oxygen to have its desired number of bonds now and therefore not have a formal charge. And it would reduce the formal charge on the sulfur by one if you calculate it out. So if we did this two times from one oxygen and then from a second oxygen, we would end up with a structure like this where now these two oxygens and the sulfur in the middle have no formal charge. Notice, however, that these two oxygens on the outside still have a formal charge. So this structure then is actually the structure that most chemists write for SO4 two minus ion. In fact, I write it be, uh, very often because I'm sort of lazy and I was sort of taught that way. But if you notice, the sulfur in the middle in the structure violates the octet rule. It has too many electrons. So what they did was they called this, they said that this atom has an expanded octet, which is really nonsense because it doesn't have an octet anymore. It has more than an octet essentially. But they said that some atoms we're able to do this because they have additional d orbitals that are available to hold electrons and make bonds. So when do we get expanded octets? Well, we get expanded octets when the expanded octet is on a third row or higher atom. Now let me flip back to the periodic table. So what we can see here is that carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, these atoms are in the second row of the periodic table. And because of that, their d orbitals are super high energy. They have d orbitals, all, all atoms have all orbitals, but what happens is the orbitals are such high energy that they're not accessible to hold electrons. In contrast, we have third row atoms fourth row atoms, etc. Third row atoms have d orbitals that are energetically accessible. So therefore, third row atoms can form expanded octets. So we see that sulfur can have an expanded octet, phosphorus can have an expanded octet, but nitrogen can't. So we generally use expanded octets when we have a third row atom with a formal charge that's adjacent to an atom with the opposite formal charge. In that case, then we can move lone pairs to between those two atoms and form an expanded octet, and it reduces the formal charges on each side of that bond. However, we cannot have expanded octets on second row atoms or first row atoms. So specifically nitrogen. So if we look at this structure again, See, this is a structure that we might think would have an expanded octet because here we have, we have an atom with a positive formal charge adjacent to an atom with a negative formal charge. You might think we could move a pair of electrons here and make that neutral, but that would give nitrogen 10 electrons, an expanded octet, nitrogen being a second row atom cannot have an expanded octet. So this is the only structure we can draw. 
And so therefore, really expanded octets are not required under Lewis rules. They're just more something that people draw because they're more comfortable. And we don't have to use expanded octets in most situations. However, next semester we are going to see just a couple of examples where there are species with expanded octets um, that there's no other way we can explain the chemistry except for using expanded octets.